Hello and welcome back to my Sandbox CDB series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.4. In the previous shuttle flight, ETS-7, a new advanced external tank was placed into orbit for future use. However, it was quickly discovered that in its current orbit, it posed a serious risk to a Hoffman station. The EDB had two options, either lower its orbit or dock it to Hoffman station. The EDB adopted the latter option, aiming to place the huge fuel tank on the docking port opposite the currently docked Orion space plane, effectively counterbalancing it. Here we see the external tank making the first of many maneuvers to rendezvous with Hoffman Station. Its tiny little radial thrusters aren't particularly powerful, and each of the burns takes an extremely long time. In order to control the external tank, of course, not only is there a controller, but the EDB had to unlock the battery that had been locked on the previous shuttle flight. So now that battery is unlocked, and if the battery gets too low, the EDB will be forced to deorbit this external tank rather than allow it to uh, remain in orbit and pose a risk. So uh, this is basically a straightforward proposition. Either this successfully docks to the station or the EDB will deorbit the tank. Now you might be wondering why there would be any difficulty rendezvousing with Hoffman Station and docking with it. And that is because the external tank isn't really fitted with normal RCS ports. It is fitted with Werner ports, which are solely meant to maintain stability during launch. They are facing in directions that are, well, first of all, they're all at the top, except for one on the tail. But that doesn't help because uh, while that might be balanced for movement in one direction, in the other directions, uh, any movement using the Werner thrusters is unbalanced around the center of mass. So that's a problem. And uh, there are no backward facing thrusters. We have the thrusters on what was the bottom of the external tank, but no equivalent thrusters on the top. So if these thrusters are used to uh, slow down, then there's no way to speed up. If they're used to speed up, there's no way to slow down. So uh, lots of difficulties when it comes to maneuvering this external tank towards the station, and we are going to see quite a lot of issues. Here we see a good view of the external tank approaching the station and clearly visible is the Orion space plane. Very large there as the external tank continues to match speeds with the station. Now, in previous docking maneuvers with the station, Jebediah Kerman had been in charge of maneuvering payloads towards the station. However, now we have additional station crew and for this docking, Neil Brett Kerman will be taking charge of this payload and attempting to bring it to dock. Again, with these distant views, you can see the colossal size of the Orion space plane, but this fuel tank is equally colossal, and so it'll be a major addition to the station, and uh, if things go badly, of course, a major risk to the station. Here, the approach continues, very carefully managed, and uh, obviously necessarily so. There are further extensions planned for the station. In fact, there are no less than six further EDB shuttle flights uh, planned in order to add modules to Hoffman Station. One of those flights will be the shuttle's own docking port, so the shuttle will finally be able to dock with the station. That has not happened yet. And of course, the station is completely built by the shuttle. The shuttle carried all portions of the station including now if the external tank is added to it, it of course was delivered to orbit by the shuttle as well. Here's the approach and Neil Brett decided to keep the little radial thrusters facing forward and so they will not be used to slow down the payload, the external tank in this case. That's a risky decision of course you see it lining up with the docking port on the opposite side of the space plane. A little bit of skew there. And of course, there is difficulty using the Verners to adjust this because they are only on one end of the external tank. And limited ability to compensate for that. Here you see it attempting to the approach the docking port seeming to be lined up here. But then a different angle shows that it is in fact a little bit off about uh, docking ports with off and here Neil Brett attempts to adjust that using the Verners 
One thing the external tank doesn't lack for is fuel. In fact, some in mission control speculated that it could potentially transfer itself to the moon. Not too sure what good it would do there, but, uh, and of course, the burn to do that would take an obscene amount of time. But here we see Neilbert having some definite difficulties, and again, the problem is there aren't any Werner thrusters that can assist on the tail of the external tank, and you can see that the tail is sort of dragging the entire tank away from the docking port because uh, it has no thrusters to compensate and balance the momentum out. And so at this point, uh, the external tank definitely posed a risk to the station. It was already approaching the station at a very high velocity, again, because uh, Neil Brett decided not to flip the entire external tank around. But it was successfully cleared of the station without doing any damage. That, that at least was uh, a lucky, lucky happenstance. After that near catastrophe, Jebediah decided to take control of the situation himself and of course uh, he decided that he would be going in backwards which means that the thrusters would be available to slow the external tank down on its approach but initially they are used to speed it up towards the station as you can see here. Given the initial failure of the station also very very slowly turned to face the external tank to help things out partially using the Orion space planes reaction control system here you see the approach now being done at night additional risk there seems to be lined up again and slowing down to a safe velocity this time instead of the extreme velocity the external tank approached with on Neil Brett's stocking attempt. But once again, uh, last minute uh, maneuvers in order to line up with the docking port proved to be detrimental. This time the thrusters, the Werner thrusters, were on the opposite end and you can see that as they try to line the external tank up, the external tank on its nose tends to deviate away from the docking port and that fouls up the entire approach. Eventually Jebediah decided that it would be best to clear the external tank away from the station and try again in the morning as the current situation was a little bit too dark to assess a proper alignment. So here we go again with the external tank on docking attempt 3 and uh, seemingly aligned with the docking port again and all things nominal. I should point out that this external tank was never meant to dock with the station. It was always meant to just wait in orbit for something else to dock with it and then make use of it. And so that's why the thrusters were not configured properly. The EDB, if this docking attempt fails, will simply send a new external tank with appropriately configured thrusters to dock with the station on ETS-8. And here we see, in fact, the external tank deviating high, and Jeb will attempt to correct. And in this case, the rotation of the external tank means that there is a fortunate set of thrusters on the upper end. Unfortunately, there's no counterbalancing set on the lower end. In other words, the thrusters on the lower end are only on the left-hand side relative to our view. And so that caused a very similar issue as we saw on the first docking attempt. And Jeb, except that in this case, Jeb has it so that the radial thrusters are, are pointed so that they can help with clearing the station. And so they're firing there to push the external tank away from the station. And at this point, the electric charge on this external tank was sufficiently low that the EDB decided that it would be best to simply deorbit it and uh, wait for a future attempt with ETS-8 to make use of an external tank. And so we'll look forward to ETS-8 having an advanced external tank docking with the station. This external tank, however, will meet the same fate as its six predecessors. With that failure weighing heavily on the EDB, Mission Control turned to its other exit mission, uh, namely the Minmus Station, headed over to Minmus with an ore drilling unit that was designed to fill up with ore 
and come back to the station where the station could refine the ore potentially for use with the Orion space plane. And here we see it approaching Minmus SOI. On entering the Minmus sphere of influence, the mission began a burn to a radio burn, mostly to uh, tilt its orbit towards Minmus to reduce its periapsis. And then later on, once it reached periapsis, it uh, made its orbital burn, roughly 220 meters per second there. And here you see a nice view of the station continuing its burn to make orbit around Mimis. The orbit was highly inclined, not quite polar, but still highly inclined to reach a large amount of locations around Mimis. And the station remained in a fairly high orbit altogether, above 100 kilometers on either end. Here it's proceeding to its periapsis in order to somewhat circularize. Mission Control deliberately decided to keep the orbit high in order to test the capabilities of the lander to make sure it had enough delta V for serious situations. And here we see the separation of the lander from the rest of the station, the refining station. And here engine ignition and uh, deployment of the landing gear. Now an orbital scanner had not been deployed to Mimnus beforehand so the EDB did not have maps on hand to discover where resources might be and so they had to rely on the narrowband scanner on the lander itself. Here you see the lander bringing itself to a very low orbit so that I could skirt the landscape and uh, check for ore locations and we'll see it doing that in a moment. The lander was basically meant to drop directly on a location with a high concentration of ore and here we'll see it find a location with 6% on average uh, concentration of ore and it decelerates, it cuts horizontal velocity basically to zero. Actually it passes that ore deposit and as a result has to start going the other way, reversing itself. And it does so in order to hit that deposit it found and then it will drop straight down onto that location. Of course with Minmus this is uh, doable. With the moon it might be a little bit more difficult to take this sort of tactic. In any case it's probably better to send uh, an orbital scanner beforehand but this proved to be an acceptable strategy in this case. Here is the landing of the drilling unit at the Midlands on Mimis. And in this case, this location happens to be a mild slope and so, so excessive caution was taken on landing. Of course, this also helped to test the margins, the fuel margins of the lander. By being so cautious this time, Mission Control will ensure that on future landings there will be enough fuel. And so we'll see that touchdown here. Landing struts able to hold the lander successfully. Six landing struts altogether on this unit. And without any delay, the EDB decided to begin drilling for ore. Another issue was whether there was enough electric charge to have ore drilling go overnight. And of course the lander does have a fuel cell. And so once the solar panels were not able to provide enough electric power, the fuel cell was activated. And so that also drains a little bit of liquid fuel and oxidizer from the tanks. Again, uh, a good test of whether enough fuel was added to this landing unit. After working around the clock for quite a few days, the landing unit finally had its load of 1500 units of ore and was able to retract its drilling units and checking whether it was in line with the station. It was relatively close, close enough to make a lift off of it. And so it sought to rendezvous with the station. Full power on launch brought uh, very little acceleration but enough. Off it goes, a heavily laden drilling unit. The power situation was tolerable, though not excellent. Perhaps some advances could be made, but uh, certainly acceptable. The question is whether the ore can be converted to enough liquid fuel and oxidizer to make this uh, an efficient process, meaning that, of course, this lander will have to be filled up again. So 
is 1500 units of ore enough to justify the trip? Uh, here we see that the uh, drilling unit adjusted its inclination with respect to the station and got into orbit on the same burn. And so here is that burn. After that it had to phase with the station and make further minor adjustments before an actual rendezvous could be made. Now while on ascent the lander was actually on one end of the station but that end actually has a large docking port, a senior docking port and so on arrival, on rendezvous, the, the lander actually has to dock on the side of the station to meet up with one of the standard docking ports. The large docking port being there for a larger modules or of course the Orion space plane itself. Here we see the station angling one of the regular docking ports towards the approaching drilling unit and also retracting its solar panels for safety. So just on the side uh, that the drilling unit is approaching from it retracted its solar panels. And here you see the approach fairly straight in but the EDB after having all of the docking woes previously was uh, was very cautious and a little bit uh, nervous. Many hours attempting to dock a huge external tank to Hoffman Station will do that to you. But here it is, the, the drilling unit successfully docked to the station and and ISRU activities commenced converting the ore to liquid fuel and oxidizer and uh, here the station is turning around so that its solar panels can face the sun optimally to aid with the conversion process and once all of the ore is converted to liquid fuel and oxidizer we'll see about the efficiency and after that we expect the naming of the station it's looking pretty good as the load of 1500 ore almost fills up the tanks on board the station and so here is the naming of the station and it was decided to name the station Tereshkova station after the first woman in space and of course Valentina Kerman's namesake and so with the failed attempt to dock the shuttle's external tank to Hoffman station but the successful test of Tereshkova station and its associated ore drilling unit around Minmus. We'll say thank you for watching this ED presentation. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And we'll see you next time.